the Troubles is what we call the period of conflict, usually from about 1969 um, to the late 90s, early 2000s. It was conflict in and around Northern Ireland, and it was all about who should both run Northern Ireland and who should Northern Ireland belong to. Generally, broadly speaking, the nationalist republican side is wanting firstly a free and independent Ireland of, of, of British rule and then a, a, a united Ireland. Its members are broadly, although not exclusively, Catholic. The loyalist unionist community, they owe their heritage to the 17th century when Protestant settlers came, particularly from Scotland. And what they want is to retain this strong link with the United Kingdom. The crucial thing to understand is that within each of those camps, you have a myriad of different groups, all with different ideas, not just as to how best to achieve this, but what's the most important thing to achieve. That's why you have multiple political parties representing both of those camps. And I think that's the crucial thing to remember. You know, we talk about sides, this side wanted that, the other side wanted the other, that's really important. And saying two sides kind of masks the reality of, 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 of many of the competing uh, issues. This is a conflict that is built on identity and historical memory as much as anything. Take the year 1916 to, to the unionist and loyalist community, that's the year that the Ulster Division um, made its sacrifices at the Battle of the Somme. To the Republican nationalist communities, 1916 is the year of the Easter Rising of the attempt to throw off uh, British rule. Same year, people perhaps living a couple of miles away will have different reasons to commemorate it, just as a kind of an example of, of what we're talking about here. These things build into an identity. You have an island, and, and the majority of the people on that island are Catholic, and a minority mainly living in the northern part are Protestant. And then at the end of the First World War, you have uh, a war of independence, you then have a treaty at the end of that war of independence, you then have a civil war in Ireland as to the extent to which People are happy accepting this treaty, what accepting the breakup of, of this this thing that we fought for. And then you have that war coming to an end with the with um the victory of the, the, the pro-treaty aspect and saying basically yes, we will create the Irish Free State. The Irish Free State is created, that then morphs eventually into the Republic of Ireland as we know it today, because drawing a line on a piece of paper, drawing a line on a map doesn't quite reflect what's going on in reality. You still have, even after partition, obviously Catholics living in Northern Ireland and Protestants living in what becomes the Republic of Ireland. And therein lies the, the tension that, that begins to escalate until the 1960s. So fast forward to the 60s. This is a period when life for the less well-off in Northern Ireland is hard. Uh, regardless of whether you're in the Protestant or Catholic community. Unfortunately, the Catholic community in Northern Ireland doesn't have access to the same services, the same uh, systems as the Protestant community. That then causes problems, divisions, resentment for the Catholic community, who then wish to redress that. And that's when you get clashes and violence. And that leads you to, in 1969, when British troops come in to keep the peace, that then leads you to uh, the situation where Northern Ireland is then run uh, directly from London. And that sets the scene for the Troubles. People of, the people of Northern Ireland get used, uh, unfortunately, to violence. But they also get used to uh, segregation um, because that's kind of the way it has been in that area. Communities that don't mix, and in many cases, communities that were divided and are divided by physical barriers, the children not going to the same schools, people supporting not just different football teams, but different sports. You know, there is very little, certainly in the, in the minds of the people in these communities, that brings them together. The only common denominator, as the journalist Peter Taylor said, is loss. Because of course, layered across all of this is violence. Both the larger scale events that we're all familiar with, Bloody Sunday, you know, Bloody Friday, massacres, you know, the battle, you know, all of these different things. But laid against that is the grinding reality of sectarian violence. A, a murder or a beating um, of a member of one community is retaliated against um, with extreme force. Um, there is violence and 
a vast amount of mistrust, not just between the opposing uh, sides, but within those groups. We know now that there was collusion between members of the British security forces um, and loyalist groups. We know that there were informers working in both uh, camps, uh, some of who were discovered and, and, and killed. And of course, both sides are committed to winning what we would call the PR war, the spin war almost. That violence is a means to an end, but violence in itself can be counterproductive. No side in the conflict wants to be seen as in the wrong. The, the way things looked was often as important as the way things actually were. So there is a growing realisation that nobody is going to fully achieve all of their aims. You have so many people with so many different red lines, this far and no further, we will not accept this, we will not accept that. It becomes really clear that actually you're not going to achieve everything. And that realisation ran parallel with, I think, the weariness about the violence. So peace comes with the Good Friday Agreement in 1998. Uh, finally, in very general broad brush terms, what the Good Friday Agreement establishes is a pathway to peace. Northern Ireland will move forward without violence on both sides. And the, the crucial thing to all of that is it will once again govern itself. So there are many occasions when it could have all gone wrong and you think, how on earth is this going to be overcome? But incrementally, you overcome each issue. So the, so the, the, the structure of peace that you've built um, is made of each of these little blocks that have, uh, that each one has taken months, weeks, years to put together. The fact that the peace process has managed to work its way through all of those things is cause for great hope when we look at it, because we talk about the world being an extremely polarised place, nobody listening to each other. The peace process kind of shows that um, in a situation that looked even worse than that, <laughs> um, talking face to face actually makes a difference um, politically. If those people have the courage to do it. Like any of these um, conflicts that were brutal and long-lasting, they don't end overnight. The memory of the violence is beginning to recede, but some of the underlying conditions are still there. There are still people who feel marginalised because of who they are. There are still people who, you know, all of these things still exist. The potential for people to be upset and outraged by their situation and to move it down a path of violence because they can't quite remember how bad it was, is very real. You get things like uh, Brexit, for example. Nobody predicted when they were uh, forging a path through that agreement that you would suddenly have another border issue completely out with your control. One country in the European Union, another part of it out. And that's the danger. You have to continually reaffirm the values that led you to a position of peace. And talking about the troubles, talking about what went on, I think is really important.